um, uh, Abhishek here is uh, as a postdoc. He's come to MIT just fairly recently uh, from from Berkeley. He worked with Sergey and Peter, and I would say that if you've seen um, any of the trending papers with RL in reinforcement learning uh, and, and, uh, and manipulation and robotics, there's a high probability that his name is on the author list. Uh, and in particular, I think uh, the thing he's going to focus on today, which is a really nice complement of what we've been doing, is is doing it on the real robot and, and dealing with the real world and data sparsity and all these issues that come up. So uh, you know, thanks for coming today and uh, we're good. Oh, yeah, thanks Russ. All right, um, cool. So my name is Abhishek. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can start to train robots in the real world with reinforcement learning. Right? And so um, it's not going to be super mathy. It's going to be more of an overview of what the challenges are in in starting to do RL in the real world and what practical issues come up and there's going to be a lot of videos. Um, yeah, so feel free to stop me at any point and we'll go over things again. All right, so uh, this is a video I like to show all the time. It's the video of the PR1 doing stuff. Um, so it's like in a living room, putting away stuff and picking up blocks and doing pretty awesome things. Uh, the problem with this video is that it's uh, teleoperated and they're completely cheating. Um, but if we could do this autonomously, that would be amazing, right? So I feel like this is what I think about when I want to design robots for the real world and I want to get these kind of capabilities. Right, so, so far in this class, um, you know, we've covered a lot of things, but here's a cartoon representation of what we've covered. We've covered a bunch of stuff for state estimation, so segmentation or pose estimation, um, things like that. And then we've covered a bunch of ways to do good modeling, right? a bunch of good ways to do physics modeling and so on. And then we've said, okay, given a good estimate of state and a reasonable model, we're going to do some version of motion planning. And when I say motion planning, I don't mean literal um, PRMs. I just mean a way to get motion. Right? Um, but the scheme is usually you, you start with some estimate of state, you start with some known model, then you extract um, some sort of controller. Right? And this works really, really well. Uh, it works a lot better than RL does. But, um, but I think uh, there are some places where it might fall short, and which is why we should study RL. Right? And so <clears throat> when I think about where it falls short, it's kind of like if we have a robot deployed into a messy real world scenario like this, your model is never going to be perfect. Right? It's never going to be perfect, perfect. So um, something is going to go wrong. And so often you'll see things go wrong, like, uh, this is a video I stole from Jeanette uh, of doing different types of grasping. And what happens is you fail to grasp, and then you keep failing to grasp the same way over and over and over. And the longer you run it, <laughs> the, worse it the worse it gets, or like the, it doesn't get any better, right? So uh, the point is that um, robots deployed in the real world, the longer I spend in the real world, they should get better. But uh, often if you have a model-based system, and you don't actually update your model in some reasonable way, it doesn't get better, right? So this makes it hard to deploy into these unstructured, messy real world environments. Okay, so a goal of a lot of my research is to build continually improving learning systems, right? So systems which um, don't just take a data set and a learning algorithm and build a model, but things that close the loop and say, okay, you're gonna start with some data, learn something, deploy, collect some more data, improve, deploy, collect some more data, improve, deploy, right? So as you spend longer and longer in an environment, you want your model or your algorithm or your robot to get better. Right? And so reinforcement learning is a great way to do that. And reinforcement learning, uh, just as a recap, is this general paradigm where you have an agent which is observing the state of the world S, taking an action A, um, environment transitions to a new state S prime, providing you some reward in the process. And the goal is to learn a policy, uh, which we're gonna call pi, which is gonna get as high reward as possible, right? So you're gonna try and continue interacting with the world in order to learn this policy to maximize your sum of returns or rewards. Um, and the nice thing about this scheme is that, in principle, you don't need any pre-provided model of the world. You can acquire that by sampling data in the real world. Um, in principle, it should be easy to acquire new skills. Um, if you have a reward function, you should be able to explore the world to get better. And if you deploy an algorithm which is you know, imperfect, you can keep improving at test time. So you don't have an algorithm that's static, it should keep getting better. Right? Okay, so that's the general paradigm of reinforcement learning. 
And where does it actually work? Well, usually it kind of works in scenarios like this. So you have um, Atari games or the game of Go or simulated character control, right? And in all of these settings, um, reinforcement learning works great, and arguably better than most other things that we have. And so we have superhuman performance in a lot of these um, scenarios. Maybe not the last one, but the first two for sure. Um, and and it works great in these kinds of like simulated game type settings, right? But in this class, we care about robots and we care about getting robots to work. And so the question is, can we get reinforcement learning to learn robotic skills in the real world by directly training in the real world, right? So <clears throat> in order to, you know, I guess the question we're gonna ask today is how do we get systems to solve these kinds of simulated toy problems um, and use those, or like how do we use the you know, methods that we have applied to those problems and try to get them to work for robotics as well. Okay, so um, the first question we should ask is why should we even use reinforcement learning and what types of environments should we use it in, right? And so when we think about environments which are unstructured, so they have a big amount of diversity, variability, or complexity, so things like our homes or our hospitals or shopping malls, things like that, uh, we probably want algorithms that can learn with somewhat minimal amounts of effort, right? So you want to drop your robot into an environment. So let's say you have this robot arm in a kitchen. You want to drop it in, say, put the kettle onto the stove and have it interact with the world to keep getting better. So in these unstructured environments where your model is not going to be perfect and you want to keep improving, those are the ones where you want to use reinforcement learning. Probably not in um, a factory where you're repeatedly doing the same thing over and over. So it seems like in these kinds of environments, reinforcement learning should um, be suitable. But if we look at you know, the current applications of reinforcement learning, they are like pretty underwhelming, right? So, you, yes? Why do you say you wouldn't want to do it in factories? Because you have better methods? Yeah, yeah, because the model doesn't change that, like the world doesn't change that much, right? It's kind of like the same thing happening over and over, and over so like there are better ways to do search, right? So if we look at our current reinforcement learning systems, uh, a lot of these are from the lab I did my PhD at, and um, they do really, really simple problems, right? So you do things like moving an arm to a fixed location or pushing a cup in like a five centimeter radius or doing things like hitting a puck where you need the, the human to be there every like 20 seconds to reset the puck, right? So none of these seem like what we want in the unstructured real world. It's not because these people didn't try hard enough. It's because um, you know, something is hard about applying RL to the real world. OK, so what is hard about applying RL to the real world? Well, maybe we can start by comparing domains where uh, RL works well and domains where RL doesn't work as well. Right? So if we look at domains like Atari games and we compare it with you know, robots learning in the real world, uh, let's see what's different, right? So in Atari games, you have rewards easily available. So you have the score, which is always telling you how good or bad you're doing. You can essentially collect an unlimited amount of data for free because um, you're in a simulator, you can do whatever you want. And <clears throat> you have complete control over your game state so you can keep resetting it and trying things over and over again. And so it lets you keep repeatedly trying, you know, trying to get better. But when you have a robot in the real world, there's no score, which is telling you how good or bad you're doing. So the reward is undefined. You have a physical system, and you're in the real world, and you can't break everything. And so um, you can't have an unlimited amount of experience. right? And you don't actually have control over the state of the world. So you can't just say, I want to set the state of the world to something uh, arbitrarily. Um, you have to like do that through your actuators. Right? So you can't, you can't reset the world to whatever you want. Right. And so clearly the assumptions that hold in the domains where RL algorithms work and the assumptions that are present in the real world are not the same, right? So there's a set of mismatched assumptions between these algorithms and reality. Um, and I'd argue that this is what makes it hard to apply RL to the real world, right? To even start training reinforcement learning algorithms in the real world. So <clears throat> at a more fundamental level, uh, I guess what this mismatched assumptions are about is that these um, these algorithms aren't able to get the right type of data in order to learn effectively, right? And so when I say data in reinforcement learning, what does that mean? So in reinforcement learning, you're going to interact with the environment. You're going to receive tuples of state, action, next state, and reward. 
and you're going to collect, let's say, n of these tuples. Right? And they're all, let's say, drawn from some distribution P, which is dependent on your policy and your exploration algorithm. So what I'm going to argue in today's uh, lecture is that the reason RL has been hard to apply to the real world is because it's difficult to obtain the right supervision or to get the right reward functions R. It's difficult to get the right distribution of data or to get the right P. And it's difficult to ensure that these systems can keep collecting data autonomously to get a large enough N. Right? So um, those are the three pieces we're going to talk about. How do we get the right supervision? How do we collect data from the right distributions efficiently and safely? And how do we ensure they can keep collecting data for large periods of time without constant human intervention? OK, so that's kind of the outline of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how do we supervise our robots uh, for RL? How do we ensure we're collecting data from the right distributions? Um, and then how do we ensure we can keep collecting data continually so that we keep improving? OK, um, yeah, pause here. Are there any questions, objections? Um, something I said which was unconscionable. Yes. Just a quick question. On the last slide, you had these uh, state action yeah. tuples. Um, how does that work if you have like the state of your kitchen counter, which might not be fully observable? Yeah, right. Um, that's a good question. I think. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes, yes, right. So the question is um, we talked about having state, and when we're in the real world and you have you know, a kitchen counter, it's not clear what the state is. Right? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I guess one way we could do this is we could represent states with things like images or sequences of images or something like that. But there's issues with partial observability that might come up. We could try using a vision system to give us some objects, et cetera. Um, but there are challenges with that in the open world. So I think that's like an open question for researchers, like what is the, what is the right state space? Cool. Any other questions? All right, so let's start by thinking about the first question, which is how do we supervise our robots, right? How do we provide them the right supervision so that they can keep learning? So in the RL framework that we talked about, um, you have you know, an agent acting in the world, you observe the state of the world, you take an action, you transition to a new state, and a reward magically shows up. <laughs> but in the real world, rewards don't magically show up. There's no one who's telling you how good or bad you're doing. So in a game, you have the score. But if you have a robot acting in a kitchen, trying to put the kettle on the stove, no one is telling you um, how good or bad your behavior is. And so you have to f have an explicit way of figuring out what your rewards are. right? And this is a fundamental issue, because if your goal is to maximize rewards, but you don't know what the rewards are, then what you maximize. Right? right. So the question becomes, how do we actually supervise these RL agents? And the typical way that most people um, supervise RL agents as it currently stands is that you start by setting up some sort of state estimation system, something that estimates where all the objects in the scene are. Or you, you put trackers on different objects or plates or boxes in your scene. You get some estimates of state. Then you spend a bunch of time programming a reward function, which is sensible and which is easy to optimize. Um, and then you say, OK, once all of this is done, then we can do reinforcement learning. Now, um, in this kind of pipeline, it seems kind of reasonable, but it's challenging to apply over and over again because state estimation is expensive to implement. So in every environment, if I have to stick markers on every object that I have or I have to retrain my vision system, it's expensive to implement. Um, reward programming requires a considerable amount of expertise. And so if you've seen any of the like reward hacking videos, basically, if you misspecify the reward, it does crazy things. Um, and it's also just difficult to write down you know, appropriate reward given states. And so when you have to do this in every single task, every single environment that you consider, it can take several hours to days to set up. And so that's kind of what has limited a lot of things to tasks like this, because you have to just move your robot arm to a fixed position. And it's easy to say, OK, you measure the distance to the goal. And um, you know, that's a way to assign rewards. And so that's, that's kind of what's limited us. And if we want to you know, scale up RL to more realistic settings, we need to figure out ways to provide reward functions in a less costly manner. Right? So we need to figure out ways to minimize the burden on the human in order to provide rewards. And so we need to go from things that are programmatically specified to a more data-driven approach to specify rewards. Right? So we want to say that 
rather than programming rewards in, we want to be able to infer rewards from easier to specify source of supervision, like raw videos of humans doing tasks or images of what successful outcomes look like, or things like language would tell you what you're supposed to do. Right? And when I say we want to have data-driven um, reward inference, what it means is that we're going to take these somewhat easy to provide source of supervision. We're going to try and extract reward functions from here so that we can actually optimize RL to learn complicated things or semi-complicated things. Okay, so the question here is this seems well and good, but how do we actually utilize very natural and easy to provide forms of supervision for data-driven reward design? So how do we um, actually take things like raw videos or success images or language and ground them into a reward function that I can optimize to get better, right? And so let's, let's think about this in the context of learning from raw videos. Right? So the problem setting we're gonna think about is we're given a number of videos of human experts performing tasks and potentially in different scenarios than the robot and we want to be able to utilize those um, human demonstrations or videos in order to actually extract reward functions which are good for reinforcement learning. Right? So you can see babies often employ this paradigm of imitation from observation where they're able to observe um, their parents or other people doing things and they're able to imitate that behavior even if it's in a different context than their own. Right? So we want to do the same for our robots. We want to say, okay, if I like show, your robot, show my robot how to you know, push, uh, push a block or ladle almonds into a saucepan and I do this, many, many times, uh, how do I ensure that I can extract reward functions from here that I can actually use to learn behaviors? Okay, so kind of concretely, the problem setting that we care about here is that we are given a number of human demonstration videos in a variety of different contexts, right? So these are just sequences of images without any actions or low level states or rewards. And what we want to do from here is, <coughs> um, we want to be able to extract a suitable reward function for learning the task in a novel scenario, right? So these demonstration videos are not provided always in the same uh, viewpoint or the same background or the same lighting as the robot. They might be provided in a variety of different contexts. And you want to be able to use these videos in order to extract a reward that I can then use for reinforcement learning to learn you know, complicated things. Um, the difficulty in doing this is that you don't actually have access to where all the objects are. Like for instance, there's almonds here. You don't know where all the almonds are. You just have videos. You don't have any actions. You don't have any low level states or rewards, right? And additionally, all of these videos are coming from a wide variety of different viewpoints, uh, different conditions. And so it's not so trivial to figure out what the reward function should be. Does the problem setting make sense? Okay, cool. All right, so the intuition that we're gonna use to you know, solve things like this is we're gonna say, Okay, if I do two things, then probably I can figure out what my reward should be. The first thing I should do is figure out what would optimal behavior by the expert look like in my own context. So let's say I got a bunch of videos from different viewpoints, different scenarios. I want to figure out what the expert would have done in my context, right? And once I know what the expert would have done in my context, then I want to make my own behavior look as much like what the expert would have done as possible, right? So those are the two pieces of intuition that we're going to use. So how do we actually implement this intuition? Well, we can implement it by first saying, um, if we want to figure out what the expert would have done in my context, we're gonna try and learn a model that's gonna be able to translate videos from one viewpoint or one context to another, right? So we're gonna say we have a bunch of videos of human demonstrations in different contexts. We're gonna learn how to translate um, behaviors between those two context, between different con pairs of contexts in the, the set of behaviors that we've seen so that when we you know, reach a new context, which the robot might see at test time, your model should be able to predict what the expert would have done in that new context, right? And so essentially you're learning a pixel level translation model, which says you're gonna translate um, frames from your source viewpoint to your target viewpoint, um, based on, let's say, like a single image which contextualizes the new scenario. Right? And if you can do that, then hopefully in new scenarios, you should be able to use this translation model to take all the demonstrations that you had, translate them into um, what the expert would have done in your scenario, and then you can try and you know, imitate them or copy them or so on. Right, okay, yes? Is that the same instance of the demonstration? You're just looking at it translating to one? No, 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 they're, they're different instances. Different instances, yeah. Um, they're roughly time-aligned, but like not exactly, yeah. But, but um, 
they do not have to be the same instance. Yeah, so the way we actually collected them is we like, um, one of us did it and the other one just like walked around with a camera and just like recorded it in different places. Okay, so <clears throat> once we have a model that can translate videos across different viewpoints, then what we want to do is we want to say, how do I make my robot's behavior look like this translated behavior, right? So in a new scenario, um, what I can do is I can say, okay, I've seen my new scenario. I can figure out what my expert would have done in this scenario by translating behavior with this translation model, right? And now when I have translated behavior, the reward function can simply be to match representative features of you know, the translated behavior and the robot's own behavior. And so you're gonna say, let's do feature matching, where we say match, match behaviors that the expert would have done and match your own behaviors. So if those perfectly match and the translation model is good, you should be able to get behaviors which do the task in the new scenario. Yes? Exactly, exactly, yes, right. So you do it between different training videos, and so you just like learn how to translate between different training videos so that in a new context that you get, uh, you can just like generate the video in the new scene, right? But the important part is that you don't actually use the pixels um, to like provide the reward function. You use some sort of representative features in order to like uh, provide the reward function, but the translation tells you how to like convert those features essentially, right? So in this case, we use um, some autoencoder style features, so we just use some you know, features we extract from a bottleneck, but you could use a smarter thing to do that. Yeah. Is there a canonical target viewpoint, or is it just, you have to, is, there, is there some sort of like? Yeah, so you, you do it between, you like do it, you sample pairs of um, source viewpoints and target viewpoints. And then you contextualize the target viewpoint by the first image in the target video. And then you do this for all pairs in the, in the the source. Okay, so putting these pieces together to kind of explain how the whole system works, um, you start with a number of video demonstrations from different contexts, different viewpoints, so on. You train this translation model that translates behaviors between these viewpoints. And then you say, okay, the robot observes a new context it hasn't seen before. It queries this translation model to predict what the expert would have done in this scenario. Then it generates this feature matching objective as a reward function, and then does reinforcement learning to learn the task in a new scenario. Right? And so, in a way, what we've done is we've gone from video demonstrations to reward functions to behavior. Right? So, if you go back to our goal from earlier, we've you know, provided a way to get um, reward functions from easier to provide source of supervision without having to program in everything. Right, so yeah, that's good. Yeah, oh, sorry. Um, uh, so the question is, did we use a sequence of observations as the reward? And yeah, the way we actually do it is we assign the reward as the distance between the translated features and your own trajectories um, per time step. And so you like, per time step, you compare the translated features and try to match it at every time step. And then you use a sum of like the distances at every time step to give you the reward. Yes. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, so what you do is, okay, so you translate this, you translate this frame by frame, right? And so then you get translated features per frame, and then you execute your own behavior, and to assign reward at every step of your own behavior, you say what is the distance between what the translated frames would have been, right? And then you sum up the rewards across all the steps, and that gives you a reward for RF. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so the question is, what do you do if you translate the expert behavior to your viewpoint, but it doesn't exa it's not perfect, right? Um, yeah, um, I guess I don't have a perfectly great answer for that. Sometimes, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> um, I guess the, fee the, the video predictions don't need to be perfect, but the features are usually easier to track than the video prediction. So even if you can see here that the predictions are not perfect, they're kind of blurry, but like the features are reasonable in order to like do tracking. So that usually works, but yeah, it doesn't work all the time. Yeah. Yeah, Alex, go ahead. 
So like a, a probably a, you know, a smarter thing to do would be to not do frame by frame, but kind of like match video to video, where you could like, let's say have a sequence model or something like that, which generates the, the target trajectory, not at the same speed, but um, yeah, that's not what we did here. So yeah, that's totally a, a limitation. Um, yeah. Any other questions? No? Cool. All right, so let's see some cool videos. Um, we have some videos here of me and a collaborator demonstrating these three tasks of pushing, sweeping, and ladling almonds. And uh, you can see here that the viewpoints change and the backgrounds are sometimes different and the lighting is not fully consistent, right? But mostly the viewpoint is changing. And then we say that, okay, we're gonna use these video demonstrations. We used around 50 demonstrations, right? And we're gonna try and first look at how well our translation model does. So we're gonna say, okay, in a novel context, let's predict what the expert would have done, right? So you can see that uh, the predictions don't look unreasonable, but they're not perfect, right? Um, they are a bit blurry, but when you use them for reinforcement learning, um, they generally work pretty consistently, so you're able to you know, learn how to push the object or sweep things or um, ladle things into the saucepan. Um, you can see that from the top, it's like not exactly the same. The, the, the behavior of the stick looks a bit different, but um, it generally gets most of the task right. Um, and the reason this, this is kind of important is because for things like sweeping and ladling and things like that, if you had to track every almond, it would become like completely impractical to write a reward function. But here we didn't have to, there's no other instrumentation on the system. Um, it's just the videos and the camera on the robot, right? So you don't actually have to track and you don't have to write a reward function for every single thing. So manipulating things like granular media is a lot easier. Or to write reward functions for that for RL is a lot easier. <laughs> right. um, the question is, do you have any intuition on the quality of the human demonstrations that you need? Um, and that's a good question. I think the demonstrators are provided by roboticists, and so they have a roboticist flavor. But uh, I think the more multimodal they get and the more like diverse they get, the worse you're going to do, because in some ways we like average across all the demos, and so uh, you're not going to deal well with multimodality. Mm -hmm. between the bones yeah. to get the almonds down, right. because you do, do it on 2D, so it's harder to tell that the thing has been translated in 2D. Um, yeah, I guess there are some markers on there which like kind of indicate that it's different, right? Oh, you don't uh, have to yeah, there's like some stickers on the spoon on the top yeah, okay. and like some shadows which look different, but yeah. Okay. I, I would say that's the, the one that is hardest to get to work. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, uh, what action space? Uh, I believe we used, uh, so the question is, what is the action space um, that we use here? I think we used um, torques on some of the joints. <laughs> so, yeah, it is a bit restricted, as in we didn't let it do full control, but we commanded torques on some of the joints directly. Okay, cool. Um, so let's see. Oops, we can skip this. So if we take a step back from this particular method, like the general point I kind of want to make is that we want to go away from programmatic reward specification and go to things which are maybe easier to specify. So you can try specifying things with examples of success. So you can maybe take an image of what a successful outcome looks like, use that to infer rewards, and that can work in certain cases, or you can try doing a language specification of what you'd like or how you want to change your behavior, and that can provide you reward functions to improve. Or you can even try doing things without any reward functions at all, or without any explicit task-specific reward functions. So you can do things like unsupervised skill discovery, where you try and just maximize the diversity of behaviors that you obtain. And that leads to kind of interesting things like running and flipping and so on. Uh, it also leads to a lot of uninteresting things. But um, uh, the point is that you, you can learn um, some level of interesting things um, using, using no, reward, no task specific reward at all. Right? So the overall point to make here is that 
uh, we need to get away from programmatic ways of specifying rewards and go to more data-driven ways of specifying reward functions. Right? And so the key point to convey in this section is basically that um, moving to a data-driven approach to reward design lets you go from taking you know, a few hours to days to specify a task to maybe like half an hour, less than that. And this is useful in robotics, but also in other domains like dialogue or education or things like that where reward functions are not that useful to specify. Providing a few examples or providing some uh, data of what you'd expect and extracting reward functions from there is probably going to scale a lot better than trying to like program a reward function. So that's the first piece of what we're going to talk about is data-driven reward inference and reward design. Uh, any questions before we go to the next part? Yeah. Can you think about negative examples or targeted mining or any of these things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a good question. Um, the question is, uh, do we think about hard negative mining and negative examples? Um, yeah, I think. In this case, the state space and the like exploration space was pretty limited, and so there wasn't that many adversarial negatives that you could mine. But in most other cases, you would need to like, I guess, the general problem of inverse reinforcement learning or extracting reward functions would need you to mine hard negatives, um, and that's usually difficult. Yeah. So yeah, in a bigger state space or a less restricted problem, we would definitely need to have negative examples for our rewards. Yeah, Alex. Yes. It seems like an equally valid interpretation. You want a nice feature and then just put a fancy word on it. Sure. Uh, on those features. Sure. So is there, is, is there a difference in like the other approach? Um, the question is uh, is there a difference between the semantics of saying you learned a reward function versus you learned some features and then you used a standard reward function? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think when you're just doing trajectory tracking, like the way we do, then you can use a really simple reward function. Like not, I guess not all tasks might, you might not, not for all tasks would you want to do trajectory tracking. And in those cases, you might want to use a different type of reward function. Um, like maybe things with um, particular force or where you want to do things at, um, Let's see, what's a good example? Like maybe where you want to achieve a particular outcome but you don't care about like matching an exact trajectory. Like in those cases, it might not just be as simple as feature tracking. But yeah, for lots of problems, I think feature tracking works well. So extracting good features might be a big part of it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's talk about the next part, um, which is how do we obtain the right distributions of data, right? So how do we ensure that our RL algorithms are collecting the right data efficiently and safely so that we can learn things in the real world? Right, so what does this mean in the notation that we introduced? So if we have reinforcement learning, what this means is we want to ensure we're collecting data from the right distribution P. But in RL, you don't have a fixed distribution P. It's coming from your policy and your exploration algorithm, and it's, getting, it's changing over time. Right, so this question really boils down to how challenging is it to you know, explore the environment efficiently and safely to collect the right data that you need in order to solve a complex task. Right? So let's say you're in this example and you want to pick up a kettle and put it on the stove. Right? Um, if you spend all your time hitting the bottom of the cabinet or sticking your hand into the sink, it's probably going to be both unsafe and really, really inefficient to figure out how to put the kettle on the stove. Right? So, if I want to train algorithms in the real world to do these kinds of tasks, you need to make sure you're collecting the right type of data to learn in practical time scales. So to understand this a little more concretely, um, if you look at the difference between like something like an Atari game or like a simulated robot, which you trained with RL, and the real world, like in the simulated game, um, you can take quite a long period of time. You can also um, collect a lot of samples, and a lot of them are really, really unsafe. So if you have this humanoid falling down all the time, and you do this with a real um, $100,000 humanoid, it's probably going to be bad news, right? Um, whereas, I, but, but if you're in a simulator, then it's okay to do that. Uh, but if you're, let's say, having a robot which is training in the real world, um, then it's not free to collect all that data, right? So if the robot goes and hits the cabinet, breaks itself, breaks um, the environment, or hurts a human, um, or things like that, wear and tear, you can't just like collect an infinite amount of data. So you need to have 
ways to collect data more efficiently and more in a more directed way. So you just you don't do things like here on the bottom left. All right. So if you compare the the trade-off between human effort and the cost of autonomous data collection, what we want to find is that with a small amount of human effort, we want to really bring down the cost of a, autonomous data collection. So we want to say, let's provide a small amount of human effort upfront and really bring down the cost of autonomous data collection so that we can collect data more efficiently and more directly, but with only a little bit of human effort. Right? So what does this mean in terms of our problem statement? We're going to say, let's take reinforcement learning and let's relax the problem statement a little bit and say, let's allow for a little bit of human provided data to be available to the algorithm upfront. Right? So we're going to say, you have reinforcement learning, but the human demonstrator is going to provide you a small amount of data upfront. Um, so it's going to provide you some tuples S, A, R, S prime from zero to N. And this is going to allow you to you know, bootstrap your algorithm, guide exploration in a lot more directed way to collect the right data in a more efficient and safe manner. Right? And so the question becomes, how do we take this small amount of human provided data up front? And how do we bootstrap our RL algorithms to you know, collect, continue improving in an efficient and safe way? Now, we want to assume that this data is not just optimal data. So it's not just demonstrators showing you exactly what to do, um, giving you perfectly optimal data, but you want to be able to incorporate arbitrary, potentially suboptimal data. Right? So Demonstrators are not perfect. Sometimes demonstrators show you wrong things. Sometimes they mess up. Sometimes you want to use data from robots doing other tasks or robots failing. Right? And so you want to be able to incorporate pretty arbitrary um, data beforehand. Okay, so that's the problem statement we're going to think about in the second part. And we're going to start by running a thought experiment saying, okay, what happens if we start with optimal prior data? Right? So um, let's say the data was demonstrations for a second. Right? Let's run the thought experiment. Uh, what we can do is we can use you know, some of the ideas Russ talked about last week with uh, supervised learning. We can say we can do behavior cloning on this, um, this good data. Right? So we can say try to maximize the likelihood of actions in this previous data, given the states in the previous data. And this is going to give us um, a reasonably good policy. So if you have a lot of data, it's probably going to be a much better policy. If you have a little bit of data, you probably need to continue improving beyond just doing supervised learning. So you can't just do supervised learning and say you're done. Instead, you want to be able to you know, continue improving using a reinforcement learning algorithm. And so why don't we use the algorithm that we've talked about? Why don't we use policy gradient? Right? So a reasonable recipe we could say is let's take our prior data. Let's run a supervised learning algorithm on it. Right? Let's run behavior cloning. It's going to give us a reasonable initialization for our policy. And then let's run policy gradient from there. Right? So if supervised learning gave us something reasonable in terms of our initialization, then running policy gradient should allow it to get better. And um, if our initialization is good, we're probably exploring in the right area. And that should get us an algorithm that you know, works pretty well. Right? So this seems like a reasonable recipe. Does it make sense? OK. OK, so does it actually work? Well, it kind of works. So if we look at some empirical evidence, we can get these uh, robotic hands in simulation to do tasks like re relocating an object or repositioning a pen or using a tool or opening a door. Um, we can get them to you know, do this by using maybe 25 demonstrations um, and a bunch of you know, fine tuning with reinforcement learning. And the reason I say it kind of works is still uh, because it takes at least 10 hours to train per task, often a lot more. And these are just like pretty simple tasks with single objects and not that much variation in positions or anything else. And the second is that we still require optimal data. So you still need you know, a big setup to get the optimal data. Um, and you need to make sure that it's like pretty good in order for anything else to happen from here. So, so it seems like if we want to you know, satisfy the problem criteria that we talked about earlier, use potentially suboptimal data, learn pretty efficiently, we need a, you know, we need a better algorithm. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> in order to figure out, yes? So how many demos were there per task? Uh, 25. Uh, the question is how many demos were there per task? Uh, and it's 25 or so. Uh, it's like 10 hours of real robot time if you convert it to real robot. 
so the question is, can you comment in, on the difference between this two-step process of uh, policy gradient plus, or supervised learning plus policy gradient versus standard off-policy RL algorithm? Um, we're going to talk about the standard off-policy algorithm next, but uh, generally the point is that uh, the two-stage process requires the data to be privileged, so it requires it to be optimal data in order to use supervised learning, and that's good in some ways because supervised learning is better than off-policy reinforcement learning generally, um, but it's also like places heavier requirements, and it doesn't let you use this prior data anywhere later in the process, while off-policy reinforcement learning would let you do that. And so yeah, that's what the next section of the talk is going to be about. Okay. So... <clears throat> So in order to figure out why policy gradient is um, so bad and why we shouldn't use it and how we should come up with a better algorithm, let's think about um, what happens in policy gradient, right? So let's start where Russ left off last week and see if we can gain some intuition for why policy gradient um, might not be suitable, right? So we think of policy gradient this way, which is saying that you're maximizing a stochastic objective, which is the expected value of some function f of g theta x plus w, where w is a random variable sample from some p of w, right? So it's saying you want to maximize the expected value of this function f at uh, evaluations of g theta x plus w. Um, that's kind of a reasonable way to express policy gradient, where you can think of f as your reward, or your sum of rewards, and g of theta as your policy. And so what you want to do is you want to learn the parameters of your policy, which get as high reward as possible. And so if we think of our objective this way, what we want to do in policy gradient is you want to like optimize this objective with gradient descent, right? And so we're going to try and say, let's take this objective and let's take the gradient of it with respect to theta. This is going to give us um, something we can do ascent on, and then this will give us good policy parameters and everything will be good. So how do we actually um, break down this objective? Well, we can rewrite this expectation on top as an integral, right? So we can rewrite it as, let's use some shorthand where we say g theta x plus w, right? Which is like um, the predictor g theta x plus some perturbation. Let's call that y, right? And so you can write the expectation on top as, an, as the integral over the likelihood of w under your perturbation, um, likelihood of y under your perturbation w times f of y times dy, right? So you're integrating over the space of y's, um, and you're evaluating your function f, right? So it's just a way of rewriting the expectation up on top. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So if you do that, let's call that j theta. What we want to compute is the gradient of j theta with respect to theta, right? So what we want to do is we want to take, um, you'll notice here that y here is a function of um, theta, right? And so what we want to do is we want to compute the gradient of this thing with respect to theta. So I'm going to skip through the exact algebra, but the policy gradient estimator basically does a little bit of, or one of the policy gradient estimators does a little bit of uh, clever algebra here, and it rewrites the um, gradient of j theta as an expression that looks something like this, right? which is saying it's the integral of p of y times grad log p of y times f of y integrated over the space of y. Right, so intuitively, what does that mean? It's saying you're going to take the expectation over all the y's, and you're saying you're going to increase the likelihood of those y's which have high f and decrease the likelihood of those y's which have low f. Right? And so essentially, if we map it into reinforcement learning world, what it says is let's replace y with trajectory style. Let's replace f with sum of rewards, capital R. right? And let's replace... Um, that's about it. And this looks something like this, right? So you're saying you're going to take the expected grad log probability times the return of a trajectory, and that's going to be your policy gradient, right? And intuitively, what this means is that you're going to sample trajectories, and you're going to upweight those trajectories which have high sum of rewards and downweight those trajectories which have low sum of rewards, right? And um, like that, that figure kind of shows you what you're going to do. So um, you're going to stochastically sample trajectories, um, and then update your parameters using the sort of gradient update, collect data again, um, re-estimate the gradient, update your parameters, and keep doing this kind of thing, right? So that's, that's the basic policy gradient estimator. And if you 
<coughs> if you go from the expectation to something you can estimate with samples, it looks like what you have on the bottom right. And so generally what it says on the bottom right is that you sample trajectories i from 1 to n, right? And then you go over time steps in your trajectory, and you increase the likelihood of an action ati um, at state sti proportional to what is the sum of rewards in the future when you took that action ati at state sti and you followed the policy after that, right? So saying you increase the actions, action likelihoods for those actions which had good reward to go in the future. Okay, does that make sense? Because if it doesn't make sense, the rest of it isn't gonna make sense. So um, yeah, do ask me questions if it doesn't. Okay, okay, so policy grant um, has this sort of form. And if you think about the problems that we talked about earlier, where these algorithms are too data hungry and they require optimal data, we can, you know, we can assign these issues to the fact that the estimator that we introduced over there is gonna be a high variance estimator. We're gonna talk about why. And the fact that this algorithm requires you to keep collecting data and computing the gradient, updating your policy, keep collecting data, um, and, and only use your latest batch of data uh, makes it an on-policy algorithm, um, as well as the fact that you need supervised learning to, you know, do su to, you need supervised learning to initialize your policy, so you need to start with optimal data. You can't take arbitrary, potentially suboptimal data and do supervised learning on it, because that's not gonna make sense, right? So the point is that we have these two issues where our algorithm is both high variance and on policy, and so it's not gonna be suitable for bootstrapping from prior data um, and doing um, efficient and uh, safe reinforcement learning in the real world like we want. Okay, so the algorithm that we want is essentially something that isn't high variance, something that is a lower variance estimator, something that doesn't just use your latest batch of collected data or expert data, so something that's off policy, and something that can bootstrap from prior data that we're provided. Right? And so that's what we're gonna try and figure out in this section of the talk. We're gonna try and figure out how we can design a low variance off policy reinforcement learning algorithm that we can bootstrap from prior data. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're gonna go into a bit of a rabbit hole, but the way we're gonna structure this is we're gonna start by looking at what is wrong with policy gradient, then we're gonna design a method that is better than policy gradient, then we're gonna see how it works when you apply it to bootstrapping from prior data, um, and maybe fix any issues that come up. That's the way we're gonna structure the next couple of slides. Cool. So <clears throat> if we write out the policy gradient estimator, it looks something like this saying increase the likelihood of ATI at STI based on sum of rewards in the future, right? This is what I'm gonna claim is a high variance estimator. And what I mean by a high variance estimator is that if I take a small number of samples and evaluate this gradient of the small number of samples, it could have pretty different values depending on the exact nature of those samples, right? So different um, sample draws from, you know, my random number generator is gonna give me pretty different values of this gradient. So um, if I want to take pretty accurate steps, I need to use a huge batch size, or you need to take this average over a huge number of samples, and that's what's gonna make all these policy gradient algorithms so data hungry, right? So they're high variance, which means they need a huge sample size, um, and that's what makes it data hungry. Now, why are these algorithms high variance? Well, I'm gonna claim that they're high variance because they're essentially single sample estimates. Right? So what I mean by a single sample estimate, that means that we sample a bunch of trajectories from i equal to one to n, right? Then you increase the likelihood of an action ATI at state STI based on the sum of rewards in the future in that trajectory i, right? But what you've done is you've only taken a single sample estimate of what is gonna happen in the future. You've only taken an example of what is gonna happen in the future in that trajectory on that set of random draws that you took, and you're gonna increase the likelihood of ATI at STI based on that single sample estimate, right? But um, the world is not deterministic, your policy is not deterministic. Um, as we talked about earlier, you're adding noise at every step. So a single sample estimate is probably going to be a really bad estimate, right? So if you take a single sample estimate, some draws could be really high rewards, some draws could be really low reward. And so what you really want to do is something that looks more like this. You want to upweight an action ATI at a state STI based on how good um, the rewards in the future are on average, right? So if I took many, many draws starting at a state STI, taking an action ATI 
and then uh, sampling from my policy. I kind of want to average what's going to happen in the future and increase the likelihood of an action at a state based on you know, the average goodness of what's going to happen in the future when I took that action. Okay. So that's going to be what we want as a lower variance estimator. Um, the problem with doing the top thing is that uh, it's, it's, it's <clears throat> inheriting all the stochasticity of the trajectory ahead. Right? And so if we could do this, that would be a lot better. The issue here is that if you want to estimate this kind of average return estimate, so you want to say, take many draws in the future, average them, and use this in order to upweight or downweight our actions, we would need to go back to the same state and take the same action and repeat this many different times. Right? But if because we're in a continuous state in action space usually, you're, the likelihood of getting back to that same exact state is essentially zero. Right? And so you're never ex actually going get, to get back to that same exact state. So it's hard to do an estimate like that unless you exactly reset to that state. And so um, it's really hard to build an estimator like this um, because you're not able to actually group many, many trajectories starting from the same state when you're in continuous space. Right? So that's why you can't just like directly do this. And that's why we resort to things like this. Yeah. Estimated the shape of the landscape in a very high dimensional space. Yeah. Um, let's see if I remember ballpark numbers. So, like, you'd use when pi is like a two layer neural net with uh, maybe 32 layers each, which is some number of parameters, <laughs> I guess, uh, like 1800 or something, maybe 18,000. Um, you'd use maybe a thousand trajectories per batch to estimate the, estimate the gradient. So yeah, that's the typical size that we use. Oh, to, to repeat the question, Russ's question was, what is the typical n that you use in computing this estimator, and how does that relate to the uh, dimension of the policy parameterization? So, or, or, the, or the time step, yeah, yeah, or the horizon. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't really ablated it very carefully, but that's the ballpark number that I use. OK, so we have this issue that we want to do this thing on the bottom right, but we can't reset to the state. We can't take many samples to get this estimate. So what are we going to do? We're going to use the magic of machine learning, right? So we're going to say that. Um, Yes, in a continuous state action space, I'll never get back to the same exact state, but I might get back to states which are like pretty close, right? And if I have, you know, a learned uh, function which estimates how how good um, state action pair is in terms of the future reward you expect to get, and um, this uses function approximation, this is hopefully going to be able to bundle our estimates across these different states, right? So let's say you have state s, s prime, s prime prime, and they're pretty close by, right? So hopefully, if you have a function approximator which takes in S and A, it's going to be able to share information or generalize across these two different states. And so your estimate is not just going to be your single sample estimate, but you're also going to be able to include information from other states that were close by. Right? And so if you use function approximation, you should be able to, in principle, um, uh, learn a better estimator, which is not quite getting to resetting to exactly the same state and doing many different things but is sharing information across states that are nearby. Right? And so that's going to be the key idea that we're going to use. We're going to say, let's learn a function which is going to estimate how good an action ATI is at state STI. And we're going to use this bundled approximator in order to lower the variance. If you lower the variance, we're going to make policy grant more efficient. If you're going to make it more efficient, we can run it in the real world. Right? So that's the logic chain we're going to use. OK, any questions? Right, so in order to understand what exactly we're going to do, let's introduce a little bit more notation. So let's say we're going to introduce this notation of a Q function, right? So what is a Q function? A Q function is saying that when you start at some state ST, take action AT, it's basically the expected sum of rewards in the future. When you start at state ST, take action AT, and then act according to your policy pi in the future, right? So 
For the first step, you're gonna take action 80, and then for every step after that, you're gonna act according to your policy pi. Right, and so the reason this is important is because essentially the thing you're trying to estimate there is the goodness of taking ATI at state STI, which is saying, okay, if I take ATI now and follow the policy after, how good or bad is that going to be, right? So this Q function is essentially the thing we need to stick into that estimator to make it better, right? So it's this, the thing that we wanted to function approximate, <laughs> it's essentially the Q function, or it's the Q value, right? And if we have a good estimate of the Q value, we stick it into the gradient, it's a better estimator, and um, we can run it in the real world and everything will be good. Okay, so, <clears throat> If we go back to our policy gradient estimator, what we want to do is we want to replace our single sample estimate of reward to go by our bundle estimate of our Q function, right? So we're going to say, oh, I think there's a typo there. It shouldn't be primes, but it's going to say, let's try and increase the likelihood of ATI at STI proportional to what the Q function is, um, Q by STI ATI. Right? And if we can estimate the Q function well, this should give us a lower variance estimate and if it gives a lower variance estimate, it's gonna be more efficient, and then we can run. Now, the nice thing about the Q function here is, firstly, that it has special structure that allows us to learn it more efficiently, and secondly, is that the special structure also allows us to learn it off policy. So we don't have to just use our latest batch of collected data or optimal data, we can also use arbitrary prior data or arbitrary data that you collected to learn this Q function. And I'll talk about why in a second. Cool. So, to understand what this special structure looks like, let's look at the definition of a Q function, right? So it's saying it's the expected sum of rewards in the future, starting at state ST, taking action AT, and then acting according to your policy pi um, in the future. Now you can break this up into the instantaneous reward at ST, AT, and all the rewards after, right? So you can say this is R of ST, AT, plus the expected value of the sum of rewards in the future when you act according to pi, starting from ST plus one, an action sample from AT plus, AT plus one sample from your policy, right? So all we've done is we've broken up steps from T to the end of the trajectory as the instantaneous reward and all the rewards in the future, right? And now if you look at the second term, the second term looks pretty similar to the definition of the Q function, right? It's just the expected Q function at the next state where you take the expectation over action sample from your policy. So you can write out the, the second term as essentially the instantaneous reward plus the expected value of the Q function where actions are sampled from the policy at the next state, right? So you can, you can see here that the Q function has this recursive sort of structure where you can write Q pi ST AT in terms of R ST AT and Q pi ST plus one AT plus one. Right. So intuitively, uh, or this is what we call the Bellman equation or um, I guess it has other names but um, this is the one I like. <clears throat> and intuitively what it makes sense, what, what it tries to do is essentially does a version of dynamic programming, right? So by saying that the Q function is the instantaneous reward plus the Q function at the next step, you can think of this as computing the Q function by doing dynamic programming from the end of the trajectory backwards, right? So you can say that, okay, the Q function at the last step was just the instantaneous reward. The Q function at the second last step was the instantaneous reward plus the Q function at the last step. The third last step is the, Q, the instantaneous reward plus the Q function at the second last step, and so on, right? So you're essentially doing dynamic programming in order to figure out your Q function um, by, by enforcing this sort of Bellman consistency. Okay, so if you look at this equation a little more carefully, another thing becomes nice and apparent here, which is that um, the Q function takes your action AT at your first step, and then it follows your policy pi at every step after, right? So if you look at this definition, this AT that you feed into the Q function isn't actually from, isn't, doesn't have to be drawn from policy pi, right? So it can be drawn from anything. Um, and as a result, this, is a, this becomes an off-policy algorithm. Basically, the Q function that you evaluate doesn't have to be drawn from the policy, uh, the, the, the action that you feed into the Q function doesn't have to come from the same distribution as the policy. Right? And so what this allows us to do is say, we can estimate this Q function where we sample actions from a different distribution than the policy because the Q function is taking in the first step of like any action, which doesn't have to be just things that sample from the policy. And so this is what is gonna give us the ability to bootstrap from arbitrary prior data and not just the, the, the on policy or the latest batch of data that we had or optimal data. <clears throat> 
Does that kind of make sense? Does the idea of Q functions, the recursive structure in them, and how we'd estimate it kind of make sense? We'll get to an objective, but um, does this kind of make sense as a way to break things down? Any questions? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> if we have this Bellman equation, it still doesn't give us a learning objective for learning you know, a function approximator for Q. So in order to get from here to a learning objective, let's try and represent our Q functions with some sort of function approximator. And let's try and say we're going to try and minimize the inconsistency in this equation. Right? So we're going to try and minimize what we call the Bellman error. We're going to say we're going to try and make Q pi SDAT as close as possible to R of SDAT plus the expected value of Q at the next step. Um, and we're going to say we're going to try and minimize the difference between these. Right? Now there's like some more caveats than how this is done, but this is the general idea. Right? So you're trying to say that the Q function becomes as close as possible to the thing that it should be, right? Because we know that has to hold at convergence. Hopefully minimizing this is going to get you the Q functions which are, which are good. Right? So we can represent these Q functions by some sort of function approximator, minimize this objective with gradient descent or whatever you like, and then this is going to give us an algorithm which is going to be able to estimate our Q functions. All right, so this is, um, <clears throat> this is going to give us a scheme to learn our Q functions, which we can then stick into policy gradient, which is going to give us a better estimator, which is going to make everything more efficient. Um, and then we can apply it to the real world. <laughs> so we've taken a roundabout route to get there, but this is going to give us our way to estimate how good uh, action A is at a state F right, by minimizing this objective. Any questions? Yeah, so in, in, this, in the, the hand opening your door, your state would be all the joints of your hand plus maybe the um, velocity of the door and the velocity of your hand and maybe the angle at which the, the door is turned, um, things like that. Okay, so let's kind of put all these pieces together, come back to the overall problem that we care about, right? So. We're going to design our low variance off policy algorithm this way. Right? So we're going to say our algorithm proceeds by starting to collect some data, then learn a Q function via the Bellman update that we just talked about. Right? So you minimize the Bellman error. You try to learn a Q function which evaluates how good a state, how good an action A is when you take it at state F. Then you're going to do, do policy improvements. So you're going to try and improve your policy using this Q function. Right? So you're going to say you can do policy gradient or you can do a different estimator to improve your policy and then you go back and collect some more data. Right? So it's taken policy gradient and stuck one more step in there, which is estimating the Q function in between collecting the data and taking the gradient step. Right? So you, you go through this procedure, and this gives you a much more efficient algorithm. Right? And Russ will tell you more about this soon. <laughs> so I just wanted to introduce it to introduce the algorithm that we worked on, but this is a roundabout way of getting there. Okay. So now that we've introduced our low variance off policy RL algorithm, let's go back to our original problem. We want to bootstrap from some prior data. We want to um, be able to use our prior data to bootstrap a off policy RL algorithm and have this learn efficiently and safely in the real world. Right? So now that we've introduced off policy RL, what we can do is take our human provided prior data, put it in our set of data collected thus far, and then you just run an actor critic algorithm starting from there. Right? So there's nothing special to do with the data. Just treat it as if you had any other data. Right? Just put it in the buffer that you had, and then run actor critic. Right? And this is going to give us a way to bootstrap from this prior data. It seems you know, exceedingly simple. So let's see how well it, how, let's see how well it works. So if you look at how well it works empirically, um, it starts off doing quite OK, but it has a huge dip in performance, where it essentially does no better than if it was learning from scratch. And so you can see here the line in red and the line in green are essentially the same. Maybe red is even a little bit worse, right? And so you're essentially getting no benefit of using all of this prior data, which seems to defeat the whole point, right? So if off policy RL was so great, then what happened here, right? What, what, what gives? Um, so the issue here is kind of subtle. It's the issue of distribution shift that happens in the process of enforcing this Bellman update, right? So what do I mean by distribution shift here? 
I mean that if we have an incomplete set of data, like our prior data doesn't cover all possible states and actions, then your Q function isn't actually trained on all possible states and actions, right? So it's trained on some states and actions, and those states and actions are good, but it's not trained on others, and those values are completely determined by a function approximation. Yes? Yes, you, uh, the question is, when you do pre-training, do you also pre-train the Q function? Yeah, you pre-train both the Q function and the policy, and then you continue collecting data and running the same update after that. Okay, so the issue of distribution shift says that on the states and actions that are in the data, the Q function is reasonable, but on states and actions that weren't in the data, their value is completely determined by generalization, right? And let's say you have a big neural net, the value when you're generalizing can be arbitrary, right? So um, if there's an action that hasn't been seen, you query the Q function, it could be completely crazy, right? So let's say there was an out of distribution action as shown here in red, and its value is completely determined by generalization. If it shows up on the right side of that equation there, right? So if you sample action AT prime, um, which is out of distribution, and you stick it into your Q function, the Q value that you're gonna enforce consistency on is completely garbage, right? And if you enforce consistency on garbage values, you make the previous Q value inc incorrect, if you do that again, it makes the other Q, Q value incorrect, and basically um, a large part of your Q values become incorrect because you're bootstrapping these out of distribution Q values. Right? And so this distribution shift that happens during our dynamic programming update is gonna make this learning process tank right here. Right? Okay, so that's, that's kind of the issue that happens when you don't have data that covers all possible states and actions. Right? So how are we gonna fix it? Well, we're gonna do something super simple. We're just gonna say, let's try and constrain our policy from not straying too far from the data that we've seen. Right? So we're just gonna say, add a constraint, which is gonna say, don't let the policy stray too far from the data that you've seen. Um, and you can work through some algebra, and this results in an update that looks something like this. It says that you're gonna do re-weighted supervised learning. Right? So you're gonna say, sample states and actions from the data that you've already seen. Then you're gonna upweight actions proportional to the exponentiated Q function. Right? So things that have high Q function are going to be increased more, and things that have low Q function are going to be increased less. Right? So this matches our intuition, but the important part here is that the states and actions are only sampled from the data that you've collected and the data that you've trained your Q function on. Right? So you never actually query the Q function at actions that are out of distribution. And because you haven't ever queried the, action, the Q function on actions that are out of distribution, you're never going to get these crazy, crazy values, or you're much less likely to. And so that's the basic logic here. You're saying um, add some constraints so don't let the policy stray too far from the prior data. And in doing so, you're not letting it actually query things that are too far out of distribution. And so you avoid this distribution shift that makes everything tank. Right, so pictorially, all it's saying is that, okay, you are propagating bad things through the chain. Now with the constraint, you just like don't propagate those things. It's the only considered things that are um, amongst the prior data that you've seen. And by re-weighting only seen data, you kind of av avoid this issue of distribution shift. Okay, so this is the basic scheme that we're gonna do. Now we, we've come up with the low variance of policy RL algorithm. We fixed some issues in it, and now we can apply it to robotics problems to bootstrap uh, RL in the real world, right? So we start off by evaluating it in simulation, uh, and we see that it, it seems to work. It seems to work better than, you know, older off policy RL algorithms or on policy RL algorithms like policy gradient. And it seems to do reasonable quantitatively. Um, it's able to you know, learn a lot quicker than all of the other algorithms and not actually tank performance that much when you start. Right. But the important part is that we can apply it to real world problems. Right? So we can consider things like training a robot to open some cabinets or like um, reposition this object in the middle of the arena. Um, and this is what happens when you do RL from scratch. You can see the exploration looks you know, not that good, potentially a bit dangerous and not very well directed. But when you start by bootstrapping with the prior data, the exploration, while it's not perfect, already looks a lot better. And with maybe um, an hour and a half of training for on the top one and maybe three or four hours on the bottom one, you can get it to you know, reposition the object and open the cabinet pretty successfully. And you can apply the same idea to other platforms like repositioning this valve with the three-fingered hand or opening cabinets with the Sawyer robot. Um, and all of that seems to work pretty well by just bootstrapping with maybe 20 or 30 demonstrations uh, plus maybe 100 random trajectories. 
So the point here is that if you have a small amount of human provided prior data and you combine this with um, a good low variance off policy RL algorithm, this is going to give you um, a much more practical way to train your robots. And this is probably going to be useful in things which are you know, robotics, but also things that are safety critical, like healthcare, or autonomous driving, or applications like that. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's training it to be close to the data in the buffer. So it's like the behavior. Uh, so the question is, the KL divergence constraint, is it against the pre-trained policy or is it against the previous policy, right? And it's, it's pi prior is all of the data in the buffer. It's like, um, it's not, we don't actually need to know the actual value of pi prior. I just wrote that for notation because if you work through the algebra, all you need to do is sample from pi prior, right? So you don't actually need to, all this means is that you sample from your buffer of prior data. You don't actually need to, um, you know, have pi prior analytically. Yeah, yeah, I know that's a good that's a good question. So the question is, doesn't that limit how much you can improve over the prior data? And yeah, that's that's a good question. It's it doesn't really let you stray very very far from the prior data. And so you can do some stitching in the prior data, like you can find paths that didn't exist, but you can't really get new actions that weren't in the prior data. It doesn't. It depends on this temperature parameter. That's what lets you like decide how much to move. Yes. Yeah. Um, so in the update that we have here, like all of the, when you train the Q function, you you use real S primes. So like the S primes are actual states that you've trained on before. So you don't actually have to like. It's less, when you explore the world, you encounter states that you haven't seen before, but when you're doing bootstrapping, you are doing bootstrapping on states that you have seen before, because those are real states and not sample states, right? Um, yeah. Yes? So a higher level question. But, yes. Um, you're estimating the Q function in the loop here. Why not just use the Q function for like ask, like get the policy? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, you, you, could, you could replace this with like, uh, so the question is, uh, you're using a Q function in the loop here to improve your policy. Why not just um, act greedily or something with respect to your Q function, right? Um, and that's a reasonable question. I think when you act greedily um, with respect to your Q function, it's a little harder to it's a little harder to make these constraints happen, right? So when you do the max over the actions on the Q function, you could how would you do it? You would either use a bunch of samples to estimate it, or you would use a some closed form optimizer to do it and uh, you'd have to add a similar type of constraint to like prevent that it's not an unconstrained maximization. You want to do a constrained maximization. So you could apply the same idea to like you know Q learning type algorithm as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, how are we doing it? Oh shoot. <laughs> uh, okay. So we have ten minutes left. Let me maybe try and get through some part of the last section. But the last section is less about algorithms and more about systems, right? So we've talked about you know, ways we can provide reward functions for these algorithms. We provided uh, low variance off policy RL algorithms that can bootstrap from prior data. But since we're um, thinking about algorithms that need, still need quite large amounts of data, we need ways to be able to collect this large amount of data in the real world. So we want to build systems that can continually keep operating in the real world, collect data, without requiring constant human babysitting, right? And so the last thing we're gonna think about is how do we build systems that have these properties? So we can start by looking at some successes of RL in the real world, right? So things like you can learn how to hit this hockey puck into the thing and open the door and open the cabinet as I showed earlier. And these seem to you know, be learning all of these directly in the real world, and so that's nice. But if you look behind the scenes, there's a lot of fudging that's going on, right? So in the first environment, there's someone who is like resetting the puck every maybe minute or less than a minute. And in the second and third environments, you have a specialized reset mechanism that closes the door every time it's been opened, or you have a specialized reset mechanism inside the cabinet that closes it every time you try to, um, try to open it, right? So it's not as simple as dropping the robot into an environment, which is you know, a natural environment and having it keep learning.
Instead, you have to like set up these special mechanisms in order to make these things happen. Right? So the whole promise of RL is that you can drop it into real world environments and keep improving, but you clearly can't yet, right? And so <clears throat> the question we're gonna ask here is how do we collect data autonomously at scale without using instrumentation or intervention, right? So we don't want to have to set up weird mechanisms like this. We don't want to have humans constantly in the loop. And the way we've been dealing with this so far is that um, we have an algorithm that requires all of these things to be done, and we modify our environment in weird ways by like setting up mechanisms like this to allow these algorithms to operate. But what we want to do is kind of the opposite, right? We want to make our algorithms work in the real world. The real world doesn't change. The algorithms need to change for the real world, right? And so what we're going to think about is how do we build algorithms that require minimal amounts of babysitting? You just drop them in an environment, and they can learn by collecting their own data for a long, long time. All right, so to answer this question, we need to think about why we even need this instrumentation in the first place, right? So one, way, one reason you might need this instrumentation is for estimates of state, like we talked about. Another reason is you might need it to estimate rewards, right? So for the door, you might need to estimate how much the door has been opened. Um, and lastly is for the purpose of episodic resets. So if reinforcement learning requires us to try things over and over, then usually you need it to reset the environment to a particular spot so you can try the same thing over and over again, right? So the stuff we talked about in the previous two sections kind of starts to address some of the questions about um, not requiring state estimates or programmatic rewards, but all of the things we've talked about still require these episodic resets. So all of the demos and the videos I've showed you all have these, these reset mechanisms hidden behind the videos, right? So can we, if we want to get RL algorithms that don't fudge, we probably need to find a way to get rid of these episodic resets. So, <clears throat> Why should we think about episodic resets? It seems like kind of an esoteric problem, right? Why, why should we care? So the reason we should care is that if you have any large scale data collection system, it only scales as well as its weakest link. So if I have a great system for estimating rewards, and if I have a great system for you know, getting state, but I still need the human all the time to keep resetting the robot, I really can't scale my data collection at all, right? So it becomes extremely expensive. And this problem itself is hard because when you're training agents without resets, they get stuck all the time, right? So let's say you're trying to push this cup to some location um, and you um, get it somewhere and maybe it slips out of the hand. The robot is essentially stuck until you either accidentally hit it again or you um, reset the robot and it tries, right? So, but if you're operating reset free, when you get stuck, you can get stuck for a really long period of time. And so you waste a huge amount of time not doing anything, right? And so Reset free RL has been you know, pretty hard to get to work. And so the thing we're gonna think about today is how do, you, how do we develop algorithms that can operate in the absence of resets? Right. So we want to build algorithms that learn how to practice or set up their own practice problems. And the question is, what should they practice on, right? So if they want to do a task, but you want to set up different practice problems, what should they be? Well, if you don't know what the practice problems or what the problems you're gonna encounter at test time are, you should just prepare for the worst, right? So try to do, try to set up all possible practice problems and say, let's try to you know, acquire in a uniform initial state distribution so we can try the task from everywhere. And if you can try the task from everywhere, then we're probably going to be good no matter what comes at test time, right? So let's say you're trying to put the kettle on the stove. A reasonable thing to do might be try to move it onto the counter, the fridge, the cabinet, and so on. And then when you practice from all of those conditions, then you can try and have a controller, which is, uh, pretty good and robust at test time, right? So I'm gonna skip over the actual algorithm, but show you some results. So if you try and do this thing where you set up random practice problems, the scheme looks something like this. You indicate what the task is to be solved, and then you let the algorithm just run unsupervised for 20, 25 hours, where you just let it collect data, just playing around with the abacus or playing around with the valve. And then you come back and you say, okay, do the task that we want, and it's able to do it pretty robustly from a variety of different conditions. And so that's good, because we didn't actually need a human supervising the whole training process. But these tasks are still pretty simple, and so we thought, okay, how do we get this to scale beyond the simple single task problem? Well, usually you don't want to solve a single task at a time, right? You want to solve many different tasks together, so you're in the kitchen, you want to solve opening the cabinet, picking up the kettle, um, closing the cabinet, and so on, right? You don't want to just learn how to pick up the kettle. And so the question we asked next was, can this problem of reset free RL be easier when you have multiple different tasks? 
And the idea here is that when you're learning multiple different tasks together, some tasks can serve as resets for others. Right? So let's say you're trying to put the kettle on the stove, but you accidentally drop it. If you just learn the task of picking up the kettle and putting it back on the counter, which you are going to learn anyways in sequence, then it just provides a reset for the task of putting the kettle on the stove. Right? So you can, just by appropriately sequencing tasks in a multitask way, you can have a scheme that does reset free learning. Right? And so this allows you to do tasks like this. You're trying to do in-hand manipulation. The object falls out of the hand. Oh, no. Let's see. All right, OK. So the object falls out of the hand. Then you figure out how to reposition it. Then you figure out how to pick it up, flip it back over, play around with it some more in hand, um, and then continue training. Right? So the point is that we can train it for maybe 55, 60 hours without any human intervention, where it's you know, dropping the object, picking it back up itself, playing around with it for some time, dropping it again, picking it back up, and it's learning all of the tasks, including the reset behavior together. Right? Um, and the final learned behavior then allows you to do things like this. Uh, which picks up the object, flips it over, and then does good in-hand manipulation. Right. So a similar scheme can also be used for things like pipe insertion. So you pick up a pipe, um, and you might accidentally drop it, but you pick back up, and you're trying to insert it onto this peg over here, and eventually you figure out how to insert it, and then you keep practicing by dropping it, picking it back up, and so on. Right. And so this scheme generally seems to be pretty successful at allowing your algorithm to train for many, many hours. And so we've gone from systems that require constant babysitting to systems you can run for maybe hundreds of hours without actually requiring any human to intervene. Okay, so let's skip through some of this. Right, so <clears throat> the, okay, maybe the overall point to convey here is that if we want our learning algorithms to scale, you need to have every component automated to scale. So you can't just have good rewards and good state estimates. You also have to deal with the reset-free learning problem. And so we introduced some ways to deal with that and go from setups that require all of this instrumentation to setups where you just drop a robot into an environment and hopefully just let it run for a long period of time, getting better um, as it gets more experience. So those are the, you know, the three ingredients of uh, real-world RL that I, I like to think about. Data-driven reward design, bootstrapping from prior data, and then doing uh, instrumentation-free continual learning. Right. And so I think that was generally what I wanted to talk about today. But yeah, happy to take some questions. Uh, yeah, so in the last example, the pipe example, we uh, actually hand specified rewards here. So we had like a discrete number of tasks, and so we just like specify which discrete task we want. Okay, so you know which are the components of the given task. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, in the example that I skipped, we didn't do that, <laughs> but there you do it by specifying a goal state that you want to reach. So you specify like what state you want to reach, and your system should figure out how to get there. 